I remember I was in L.A. I got a phone call from my friend Tom, who goes, uh, did you hear what happened? And he woke me up. Did you hear what happened? Guess what happened? Blah, blah, blah. And I literally stopped him like this, Tom. I just, what, what happened? What happened? You know, he's going, turn on the TV. And I go, Tom, just tell me what happened. He goes, a plane crashed into the World Trade Towers. And I bolted up. I, and I said, Tom, I'll call you back. And I turned on the TV. I'm lying there with my wife. And I'm looking, and I see what's going on. But I looked at it, and I, I literally said, our world has changed. Nothing will be the same. Now, that sounds so prophetic and everything, and oh my gosh, on but I had no idea to the extent that our world would change. Um, yeah, and literally, I had no idea. I said, oh, it's all going to change. And, and if you ask me to, add, to, to think how it would change, I couldn't name the things. Whoever thought we'd be taking off our shoes to go to an airplane? It just it was ridiculous. Who would think that there were computers to take out of a suitcase or out of your carry-on because you're going on a plane? I, I, I couldn't imagine it. One thing that was interesting to me about how the world changed is, and I think that there may be some who disagree, I think that we took trouble in the Mideast more serious. Because there's always been trouble in the Mideast. We know how far along it goes back. There's always going to be trouble in the Middle East, especially with the Jews and everything. But for the first time, trouble in the Middle East was at our doorstep and, and would threaten us and the implications, not just at the uh, gas tank, which, of course, we feel, but, hey, let's fix things over there. But, oh, my gosh, there are people who may be getting together to hurt us in our homes. And I don't think that ever happened before. So uh, uh, I think that was the implications that I sort of saw or, or have noticed uh, over the years. But like I said, I said things are going to change. I didn't have any idea what I, what I meant by that. What I remember about 9-11 is the opposite of what happened is I saw my daughter, my oldest daughter, for the first time. She's nine years old now. Uh, I saw her on a uh, ultrasound this, this big. It was the first time we saw her. And I remember we went to the doctor's office. They were going to show us a tape of what we were going to see when we went in and saw the ultrasound. So we're looking at the tape, and I see it. And the minute the tape is over, like an eight-minute tape, I said, take it out, let's watch TV. So we were watching the horror of the day contrasted with the beauty of seeing my daughter. I like, you know, and, and then when we go in, we see on the screen the beauty of what was to be, uh, you know, six months later. And, or five months later, so, and then to come out and... I sort of didn't want to leave the office because I wanted to see what was going on with the news. Uh, by the way, I have a friend who's an actor. Now, I was in L.A. going to the, the obstetrician. I was working on Spin City at the time. I know somebody who had to go to Long Island. No. He lived, I think, in Brooklyn. Came in with his wife to see their obstetrician and take a look at his kid or go in for the checkup. And there was no transportation outside. You couldn't, you couldn't leave. So he's, he and his wife are stuck inside the city because all thoroughfares were closed. So he really had it worse. Uh, I heard stories about the actors walking up Broadway, maybe going to the theater, finding out that the show was canceled that night, and people walking up Broadway uh, with the smell of the disaster in the air, literally, figuratively, no traffic, people walking in the middle of the streets, walking home from their, I mean, people were walking home from their jobs, that's obvious. But here, an actor is very lucky. He gets to go and play for a living. And here he's not allowed to go play and must walk that distance home saying, I, I can't do what I love. I can't 
you know, an actor's job is a little different from other people's. And, uh, and I remember Nathan Lane talking about the first time that the producers raised its curtain after 911. I don't know how many days it was. Four, five, six. I, I don't. Three days. Yeah, and they didn't want to, and I think the mayor asked specifically for the producers to go on because you needed laughter. And what a difficult time that must be for an actor to go out on stage and say, "Will you put all thoughts that are still smacking you in the face? Will you put them aside and let us do what we do?" And still, how do you ask, it's one thing to ask an audience, how do you ask an actor to do that? You know, I mean, everybody thinks, oh, you're so sunk into the part. And they're, BS, you're, you're thinking about other things. You're thinking about, will they laugh? You're thinking about, wow, my, my apartment smells of, of smoke and, and ash. Yeah, well, needless to say, the producers was not, uh, was not an empty house. They were, you know, everybody was still new. Everybody was waiting to get back. Yeah, that's tough. I remember Gary David Goldberg. We, you, you know, we came to work, and Gary David Goldberg, of course, uh, who, who was the producer of Spin City, uh, uh, we had the day off. I, I didn't know whether it, you, you know, it's, it's very funny. Ten years later, you absolutely see the implications of this tremendous, tremendous disaster. You don't know whether or not you're still going to go to work that day in much the way that George Bush kept on reading a children's book not knowing the implications of this tremendous, tremendous disaster. He was wrong. We were somewhat wrong. Of course you had the day off, of, and of, of course you were sent home. The word day off isn't right. Of course we were not working that day, nor the next day. Uh, Gary, who is a New Yorker, born, bred New Yorker, and therefore created Spin City as an homage to this town that he loved, uh, made a conscious decision not to ever bring up this disaster and how it affected the town. Uh, it, it was a fictitious New York City and would remain that way, but what was real was the heart of New York City, the people, but uh, it was never, never mentioned. And in thinking back, I don't know whether or not the uh, Twin Towers were seen in the opening credits. But I'll tell you this, you watch Working Girl, and it's the beginning, which is such a glorious shot from a helicopter at one or that takes you right onto the ferry. You just can't look at it the same. It's, it's quite something. Uh, and cinematically, I don't think it's what Mike Nichols wanted. But cinematically, I think that he may be delighted that it's been preserved in such a beautiful shot. Uh, but, I, you know, a crazy thing, I, who knows whether this will make, make your TV show, but uh, I was never a fan of the Twin Towers. I, I, it may be a figure of controversy about whether or not you liked it, whether or not it was interesting. I never, never liked it. But it's amazing how much I love it today. And that's a very sad thing. Because it was ours. It was New York. No, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it's because of that. It's because in an infantile way, they took it away so horridly that, that of course, that, 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 that they didn't take away the Twin Towers. They took away something that was America's, that was ours. They, they, they destroyed it. it. Architecturally, it was just an ugly sight, but I'm saddened that it's not there, not because of the architecture, but because of, of what was symbolically taken away. You know, I, 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 have, I have three kids who, uh, who you have to psychologically maneuver. You know, if, if one person wants one thing and another person wants another, you have to tell, and, and they, they one should get it. You have to trick them into not wanting it or wanting it. And we were, in essence, tricked like children to saying this is, no, that's not the word. 
I know that I have a point, but you, you know, if, if a child wants something, you have to make it ugly for them if they can't have it. Or if they don't want something, if they don't want vegetables, you have to say, wow, you, look how many of your friends are eating the vegetables. Well, the same thing was done with the trade towers, is that they, they took them away and all of a sudden we wanted them. This is a horrible thing to say when we are acknowledging the anniversary of these buildings, but we're not, we're not acknowledging the anniversary of the buildings. We're ac acknowledging the anniversary of a symbol being, being upended, being a, of, a, of a, a carpet being pulled out from under us. And it's not just the World Trade Center. I mean, it was that whole day. It was the Pentagon. It was, you know, Flight 93. It was... You're right, and, and I, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, what, when you think of the Pentagon being damaged, it, 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 my mind hangs open uh, that, that they got, that they knocked down our soldiers, the, the home of our soldiers. And really, I think all that I remember is didn't Regis Philbin's son work in that building. That is, it, I, I, but everything pales next to the toppling of the towers. But because of the movie, uh, uh, United 93, and that now stays with me. But I think the movie had to be made in order for something visual to smack my mind. The Pentagon was not as visual, at, or I guess in, in my fears, it's very visual. But the Pentagon is still there. But United 93, because of what Paul Greengrass directed, smacks me in the face of what human beings were like on the flight, that this plane was taken down by civilians rather than God only knows what might else have been taken down and the people who sacrificed their lives. Up until that movie was made, it just did not resonate with me as strongly as I now see United 93 did. Um, the trade towers resonate with all of us. We saw it firsthand. It's and, and and over and over and over, we saw it firsthand. We continue to see it. I dread the anniversary of when we're going to see these images again. The head chef at the uh, Windows on the World and the Trade Towers uh, came to work that morning. Walks in, his secretary says, "Your glasses are ready." He goes, "No, I bought them in yesterday. They're supposed to be ready on Thursday." She goes, "They just called. They're ready." He went downstairs, went to the place to pick up his glasses, came back, and his staff was dead. His entire staff had died. And he devoted quite a few years of his life to cooking for all the volunteers down at the center, at the Ground Zero. Uh, a great man to begin with greater in the face of this tragedy and uh, since a few years ago opened a steakhouse over at uh, Time Warner Center. A great guy, uh, devoted years to probably, to helping others, but probably help his, his soul. But I mean, oh my God, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. It's, it's like so yeah. like I've then gone to uh, uh, a charity event out in uh, Long Island in Garden City, where within a, my God, I don't know, but it's a mile or five mile radius, family upon family upon family lost the breadwinner of the family, and they have fundraisers so that these children can grow up in the manner to which they're accustomed. And I'm not just talking stockbrokers, I'm talking the firemen, especially out in Garden City, all of these people who, who were whose livelihoods, you know, the, the, the breadwinners were all, were all taken away. I'll tell you something else, and this, is, you know, this will never go. I am, I know a shitload of people. I know a lot of people. I don't know how I escaped it. I don't know one person who was in that building. And I know, I, I'm sure through six degrees of, pardon me, six degrees of separation, I've, I've known some people and, and have met, and you know, well, my brother-in-law was at Canna Fitzgerald or whatever. 
If you asked me to name somebody personally, by name, I didn't know anybody. And, and I, I don't know how I escaped that, being a New Yorker. And, uh, it's, uh, there was at least one degree of separation, I think. For, uh, for, for everybody, of course, of course, of course. But right. that there was no degree of separation, right. uh, to me, is astounding, uh, you know, as a, as a New Yorker. Uh, just astounding. One thing that I do remember is when we went back to work on Spin City, Michael Fox, Michael J. Fox, was working as a guest star on that episode. And we were doing it in Los Angeles. We had, we had uh, left uh, New York, we located to LA with Charlie Sheen as the lead. And I remember Michael desperately, desperately trying to get any form of transportation to take him from LA to New York to see his wife. And at the time he had three kids, he since had a fourth. But to, to, to see his family. There was nothing he could do. He couldn't get a private plane. He couldn't get anything. There were no planes going around. I, I mean, he, you know, for us, it's now hitting us. Oh, we can't, you know, we always have to have an ID. We always have to go through it. It takes us so long to get through the security. Uh, but, I mean, it smacked him in the face. Then can you imagine being away from his family who was in New York wondering what's going on? Uh, I, I just can't imagine it. And he was, he was beside himself trying to, to find a way back. Yeah, that's what I also remember. You know, I, uh, be, because I love acting so much, I love to act, and I, I wish I could say I do it for everybody. I really do it for me. I happen to love what I do, and I always feel like I'm the most blessed man to be able to do something that I love. I don't think that acting ever changed the world. I don't think the arts change the world. But I do feel that the arts bring comfort. I do feel there is a place for the arts to take our mind to other places, to broaden it, to entertain, to say, hey, we need to laugh, is just another way of saying, I think we need, we need to feel something opposite than the dread that we're feeling now. And it's still hard in times like those to go in and try and do anything. And certainly laughter is the last thing we're going to try and do. But God gave us a great ability to forget. I don't know how, but if we feel the same pain that we feel on 9-11, on that day of 2001, we could not go on for the past 10 years. We just, we can't. So thank God our memories dissipate. Doesn't mean that we feel any the, the less uh, uh, sad or that we are callous human beings, but it dissipates. I think the art, the arts help us through an evolution, a, a symbiotic evolution of what is accepted versus how we feel, and they just sort of mesh, and they go on, and it snowballs, and you end up 10 years later, maybe even, dare I say, making a joke about what happened that day, or thinking how you felt. Uh, and, of course, it couldn't be told on September 12th, that particular joke, or even go on doing the, uh, some play. Why would you? It's, it's funny. It's the same play. It's just in bad taste if you did it on September 12th. It's just, uh, it is an, an evolution that I think that the arts do help uh, with the healing process. Uh, doesn't change anything. I really don't think it changes anything in the world, but it works in tandem with the human spirit. <laughs>